The Hells Angels have a complex and sordid past. Their notorious reputation follows its members wherever they roam. However, some acts are so deplorable, even members of the United States' most notorious motorcycle gang choose to turn on their own following their morality. No case illustrates this fact more powerfully than that of Otis Buck Garrett. But how despicable must an act be for the grim brothers of the Hells Angels to turn on one another? Hi, I'm your host, Zach Williams. Welcome to Compulsion. Even in the twilight of his life, Otis Buck Garrett's figure cuts a chilling swath through the air. His grizzled face flanked by the streaming trails of his faded white handlebar mustache, it is clear this man was once a force to be reckoned with. Described as a one-time millionaire dealer of crank, Garrett had an infamous history as a renegade among renegades. A man that was such a loose cannon, even his brothers in the Hells Angels viewed his actions as sacrilege. Even before we reached the beginnings of our case, Buck had a violent past. He first entered the public record when in 1973... He, along with two other Hells Angels, attempted to gun down a Marine in the streets. The story made the headlines in newspapers and was simply the first chapter in Garrett's budding notoriety. Garrett was heavily involved in a hostile takeover of the San Francisco Hells Angels in January of 1977. The chapter president, Harry the Horse Flamberius, had spent most of his life as an angel. He was the epitome of an old-time angel, a brawling boozer who saw nothing for the angels to gain in peddling drugs and whores. Flamberius and his old-school ilk stood in the way of Garrett, Flash Gordon Grow, and their legion of young upstarts. Grow and his posse had dreams of pushing the angels into the business of prostitution and narcotics. Flamberius was not interested in this youth movement. As an obstacle to Garrett, Grow, and their goals, Flamberius's days were numbered. On January 6, 1977, the young upstarts abducted the horse and his 21-year-old girlfriend. They bound them in duct tape, covered their heads with pillows, and ended each of their lives with a well-placed 22 bullet to the head. Following the execution, the San Francisco Angels mourned the loss of their fearless leader. Ever the sly and sinister characters, Gro and Garrett led the funeral procession for the man they had summarily eliminated even laying his favorite Harley to rest on top of him in a special angels-only ceremony a month after his death. So ingrained in the biker gang culture was the horse that he could not be laid to rest without his trusty bike. Even his favorite dog, Chopper, was buried with a toy Harley motorcycle when he died many years later. Following the execution, Flash Gordon Grow was elected president of the San Francisco Angels. Grow and, by extension, Garrett finally had the power and control they had long craved. They would now be able to steer the angels towards the narcotics trade and prostitution as they had desired for so long. The Grow-Garrett coalition had deep roots, evidenced by their partnership in operating The Love Nest, a massage parlor and thinly-veiled front for a prostitution ring. This was an early glimpse into what would become Grow's vision for the Bay Area Angels. Garrett was heavily involved in the day-to-day operations of the Love Nests, recruiting and evaluating talent and making sure they stayed in line. The girls were held captive in a boarding house, ensnared by a web of debt and incapacitated by the haze of drugs Garrett would force upon them. It was inside this tangled den of sin where Margot Compton's path would fatefully cross with Otis Buck Garrett. For most of her life, Margot Compton had been in a breakneck flight from crisis to crisis. Compton's childhood was not an easy one, a child of a working-class home with a broken marriage. Her sister said that they had always admired Margot's ambition to do better. In her youth, Compton loved to write short stories and was a talented portrait painter. She had plans to go to a beautician school, but according to her sister, the deck was stacked against Margot from the beginning. Margot and her sister Lynn had a total of ten siblings growing up, and life was never easy for the family. In 1969, at the age of 16, Margot married Doug Compton, and for a time, life was good. She and Doug worked bagging groceries at the local market, planning out their future together. Alas, a rosy future was not to be had, as Doug began hanging around with the Nomads, Garrett's wing of the Hells Angels, which was at the time stationed in Vallejo. 
The couple started doing drugs, and Doug allegedly beat Margot. By 1976, Margot could take it no longer. She chose to flee her abusive relationship with Doug. As it was, fleeing from the spiteful wrath of her husband, Margot had few options. In desperation, she turned to the most powerful man she knew, Otis Buck Garrett, then a chieftain in the Nomads. Garrett initially seemed to be the answer to her immediate problems, and Compton felt relief in the sanctuary Garrett provided her, until it became apparent that Garrett merely wanted to use her as a prostitute. Garrett forced Margot to undergo a sex test to prove her proficiency at oral copulation. Having satisfied his perverse requirement, he gave her a room and a house he kept for his hookers and put her to work in the love nest. Destitute and without options, Margot felt trapped in the love nest. Much like she had as a child, she yearned for a better life for her and her two precious twin girls, but there was little she could do but accept the current dire circumstances. However, after just seven weeks, a client went too far. He beat and raped Margot. That was the last straw. She went to Garrett to untangle herself from the twisted love nest. Garrett refused to release her, citing a debt of $4,800 for protection from her husband and her weekly amphetamine fix. Having exhausted the last option to remove herself from under Garrett's thumb, Compton made the dangerous choice to tell the police everything. She told officers about the fact that she and four other love nest workers had returned 40% of their tips to the Angels. She also alleged that the operation had the protection of two San Francisco vice officers who were paid off in cash and sexual favors. Naturally, the authorities were very interested in Margot's story. Not overly fond of the Hells Angels to begin with, any hard evidence that they were up to no good was good enough for the San Francisco PD. Not only did Margot tell her story to the police, but she also chose to take things a step further and testify in person against the Angels. This bold act to better her circumstances placed Margot directly in Otis Buck Garrett's crosshairs. It is best not to complicate the explanation, but suffice to say, Garrett saw Margot's turning snitch as the ultimate betrayal. As the wife of a member of the Angels, Doug Compton, Margot was family, after all. Around the time of her initial testimony, Margot had begun dating Don Sessler, a Bay Area used car salesman. Following her testimony in the winter of 1976, Compton and Sessler left San Francisco. Margot, Don, and her twin six-year-old girls began to make a new life for themselves in a cottage in the rural village of Laurelwood, Oregon. The forlorn young mother of two busied herself with the upkeep of the cottage. Keeping to herself and rarely leaving its confines except to shepherd her little ones home from first grade each day. To the other residents of Laurelwood, the family seemed to be on edge fleeing from the fleeting demons of Margot's past. But as the spring came to thaw the ice, so too did the fear surrounding their cottage seem to melt away. Margot started making friends with other people in town, the twins were seen playing outside after school, and perhaps rather unluckily, Margot's secret project slipped out and came to be known around town. Margot was writing an autobiographical piece on her life in California as a prostitute for the Hells Angels. The book would name names, point out places, and it went into great detail on how the Angels took away her autonomy, forcing her into a life of prostitution and drug dependency. It detailed their brutal beatings and her eventual escape into the arms of the state in return for her testimony. Unfortunately, Margot could not stay away from her past forever, as she returned to San Francisco for additional testimony in July of 1977. As her court sessions wrapped up, Compton would sense danger in the air, and summing up her sister's regrettable situation, Margot's sister Lynn stated, quote, She was trying one more time to turn her life around, but she messed with the wrong crowd. Back in Laurelwood, Margot was beginning to fit in. Some of her behavior still rubbed the conservative community the wrong way. She was known to walk around in revealing short cutoffs and a halter top. Despite this, some befriended Margot, as it was clear she was genuinely trying to turn her life around, and she was a noticeably affectionate mother. One such friend was Bonnie Sleeper. At the time, Sleeper was just 18 years old. Sleeper was engaged to Gary Sessler, a member of the Coast Guard and the son of Margot's boyfriend, Don. Quote, you could tell Margot had a hard life, but she was getting happy, said Sleeper. She had found something that really made her feel good, Don, and a small, quiet country community where she felt safe. Though Margot was continuing to integrate into the community of Laurelwood and had made fast friends with Sleeper, 
the looming danger of Otis Buck Garrett was ever on her mind. She was convinced he would come after her, and as a deterrent, she and Don had hidden half a dozen guns throughout their little bungalow. They were under the couch, by the bed, and anywhere Margot and Don could find that would accommodate a hidden firearm. Quote, I have been through hell, and it's not over yet, Compton wrote in a letter to her parents the week before she was killed. My life, I suppose, to other people, has been a series of unbelievable events. As Margot had suspected, Garrett and his hellish angels were not simply resting as the rats scurried away to the safety of the Oregon wilderness. They were poking and prodding, gathering information and waiting for the right time to pounce. While in Laurelwood, Compton had been corresponding with her relatives in Vallejo, and the angels were able to intercept one of her letters, revealing her Oregon address. This small piece of damning information was all the angels needed to prepare for their retribution. Bonnie Sleeper was the one who found them. As she drove up to Margot's small cottage, the sun was sinking behind the mountains, and she had a strange feeling. She got out of her car with an armlet of flowers and could tell something was wrong even as she worked her way to the front step. The front door was locked, but Bonnie heard harsh tones of rock and roll blaring from a radio inside the house. Upon going around back, she found the back door opened with ease. What laid beyond the back door, framed in the fading light of dusk, was enough to momentarily render Bonnie senseless. Then, like a freight truck, it hit her. The scene was something out of a horror film. Two bodies sprawled across the floor, one Margot Compton having finally met the fate she had so long feared, the other Gary, her fiancé. The following is Bonnie's account of what transpired next, according to the article published in the San Francisco Chronicle entitled, When Jailbirds Sing. Gary, Sleeper blurted out reflexively, setting the flowers onto an armchair. Lying in a slowly growing lake of blood from two bullet holes in his head, Sessler turned his face toward her and gasped. Sleeper stepped toward him, tripped on Compton's blue, cold legs, and then bent down to her fiancé. Gurgling in his own vomit and blood, Sessler couldn't form the words he seemed to want to say. Sleeper bent in closer, and all she could make out was a recording on a phone, lying off the hook near his head, and suddenly seeming so awfully loud it filled her ears, repeating, If you'd like to make a call, please hang up. That's when I lost it, Sleeper recalled recently, shuddering and clenching her eyes shut as the memory washed in. I just turned and ran, and then I screamed and screamed for help. While the scene is tragedy enough, it was not merely Margot and Gary who had been unfortunate enough to meet the business end of a Hells Angels pistol. As police roped off the house and dug through the freshly minted crime scene, they made a truly horrendous discovery. Margot's six-year-old twins, Sylvia and Sandra, were lying face down in one of the bedrooms, their matching orange and yellow striped swimsuits covered with a bedspread splattered with their blood. Their eyes closed clutching their favorite teddy bears. One girl still held, clenched in her fist, a glow-in-the-dark Cracker Jack sticker. Each girl had met their end with a twenty-two caliber bullet placed behind their left ears. In the coming investigation, it was uncovered that the girls were shot as they held their teddy bears to their chests. Their mother penned against the opposite wall, made to watch as the gunman ended her daughter's lives. Margot was finished off with three successive shots to the head, while Gary had been the first victim, gunned down so he could not interfere with the biker gang's revenge. The guns, which had been meticulously hidden throughout the house, were never drawn. The gunmen encountered no resistance, merely swept into the house, snuffed out four lives, and went on their way. Don Sessler had luckily been out of town on that day, and investigators determined that the victims were likely either tricked into complacency or caught so unawares that they were too surprised to act. With such a messy scene and the clear logical connections that Margot had to Garrett, it is easy to assume that the law got its swift vengeance on the crank kingpin. Alas, this is not the case. Though the details of the case were clear enough for the Rolling Stone to put the pieces together in 1979, issues plagued the legal investigation. Ultimately, on that fateful day in 1977, the killers came, disposed of their targets, and fled to the safe haven of their bikes and their crank dens. Justice would have to wait. It is some small comfort that the testimony Margot gave her life for was not all for naught. 
In October of 1977, Garrett was given jail time for his part in running the Love Nest, and it was Margot's testimony that provided the ammunition the state needed to put Garrett behind bars. Unfortunately, this short jail sentence would do little to put an end to Garrett's reign of terror. It would be nearly two full decades later, in 1995, that Margot and her twins' killers were finally convicted of the murders. The conviction would not have happened without the unyielding investigation led by an Oregon sheriff's investigator and testimony from dozens of killers already behind bars in California. Garrett may have not been included in the case had the life term he was serving for a narcotics conviction not been in the process of potentially being overturned. How did this intrepid investigator assemble his merry band of snitches? Why was Garrett's conviction due to be overturned? And what drove this lone man to dedicate two decades of his career to finding justice for the victims of this grisly killing? Mike Graham, a starry-eyed deputy and a newly minted father himself, was one of the first cops on the scene in 1977 when he was called to Compton's house. The image of the slain twins, laid in their blood-stained bed with their favorite teddies, burned itself into Mike's head and drove his relentless pursuit of the men who snuffed out their lives for nearly two decades of false leads, tight-lipped bikers, and dashed hopes. In a quote from the San Francisco Chronicle, Mike said, quote, It was the kids. That's the mistake Garrett made. He's a boastful, arrogant man, and he killed kids. Even criminals don't like that, let alone the good guys. He sucked in a quick breath and set his lips. Real men don't like it. Graham's dedication to the case, complicated by the vast distance between the site of the killing in Oregon and the home base of the perpetrators in California, came at a price. It contributed to his obsessive, workaholic nature that ended his first marriage and led to his voluntary dismissal of promotion options so that he could continue his intrepid quest. It was also marred by the usual hazards of poking around the hornet's nest that was an outlaw biker gang. He had his life threatened, was chased down by attack dogs, and was told to screw off more times than he could remember. In his own words, quote, Let's just say there were quite a few times of jumping over a four-foot-high cyclone fence and running into pit bulls. Garrett was indelibly linked to Compton and was quickly suspected to have something to do with the slayings. Unfortunately, it was not as simple as finding the biggest, baddest biker with a motive to kill Margot. Garrett himself had not pulled the trigger, nor had he even been present. He had ordered the hit, and it was carried out by professionals who left very little in the way of material evidence. There were no fingerprints, no gun, and no usable leaks from the Hells Angels. The lack of usable leaks stemmed from the tight-lipped nature of outlaw biker gangs when confronted with the police. It made building a strong case against Garrett nearly impossible. Yes, initially the Hells Angels would shelter their own from the police, even when the deaths of small children were involved. It is important to note that as time passed, this detail of the murder was still an integral part of compelling testimony from the men who did come forward. As the case went ice cold, Graham continued his pursuit, but in terms of building a case he could actually bring to court, hopes were fading. By the early 1980s, snippets of information began to creep up to Graham from the California prison system. Informants behind bars had begun to chatter about the quadruple hit in Oregon. Thus began the Sisyphean task of interviewing hundreds of inmates who claimed to have information relating to the case. Each individual's story then had to be cross-referenced to his fellow inmates to match up stories and ensure that there was no false information included in his case. Along the way, the case was further muddled by the deaths of many potential witnesses. Many of the Hells Angels who knew Garrett had passed away, including Margot's estranged husband, Doug, who died of pneumonia following an episode where he was attacked with a hatchet in his bed in 1987. Dick Grundy, a former Solono County District Attorney, who assisted Graham with his investigation, summed up the case in a San Francisco Chronicle article with the following statement, quote, You can name all the characters involved in the Compton thing and around it, and every time you turn around, there's a body somewhere. Many leads began with promise, but failed to yield results. Others provided useful information matching known facts of the murder, but then out of fear for their lives went cold for years until they felt safe enough to go on record. The first major break came in the case in the mid-1980s. The investigation was able to obtain a detailed account from Iron Mike Thompson, 
former leader of the notoriously deadly Aryan Brotherhood. He claimed that Garrett had personally confessed to the hits while at Folsom Prison, and one of the alleged shooters, McClure, boasted of them in San Quentin. This lead provided the spark that allowed the investigation to pick up steam, and finally in 1991, Mike Graham had his case. He handed his case file over to an Oregon grand jury. Garrett and the shooters were caught and detained, and there would finally be a trial for Margot and the twins' killers. Mike is quick to point to countless others who assisted in the investigation, but they will all defer praise back to him. Another quote from Grundy in the San Francisco Chronicle stated, quote, Mike Graham is not just a good investigator. He was the only one with the tenacity to see this whole case through, beginning to end. You can't say enough about the guy for sticking through it. Graham's investigation named Garrett as the man who ordered the hits. They were carried out by Bug Eye Bob McClure and Benjamin Psycho Silva. While all three were named in the investigation, each had a different path to justice. McClure was out of prison at the time of his arrest, and his was the least twisted path to resolve. Garrett was already in prison on a lifetime sentence, but through a twist of fate was tried despite that fact. Psycho Silva was never charged. Prosecutors had determined the added expense and effort was not worth it, as Silva was already on death row for the 1981 kidnapping, rape, and torture of two college students in Lassen County. McClure was named and convicted in the summer of 1994. He was a Hell's Angels wannabe. According to witnesses, it was him who killed the little girls while his accomplice Silva held them and wrapped their arms around the bears. At the time of his arrest, McClure already had a long rap sheet for murder and narcotics charges stretching back to the 1960s. Garrett was already serving time in Lompoc Federal Prison on a narcotics conviction that carried a life sentence. William McCall's article in the local Hillsborough paper detailed Oregon Attorney General Robert Hamilton's statement on why Garrett was finally being tried for the murders. Quote, Because the case against Garrett was expected to be monstrously expensive, Hamilton said, authorities considered not trying him on the murder charges because he already was serving a life sentence. But a ruling last summer by the Ninth U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals concerned them because Garrett's drug conviction could be overturned. The ruling said the double jeopardy prohibition of the Fifth Amendment bars the government from reusing the same crime as the basis of both a criminal prosecution and a separate civil forfeiture, and the government had seized land from Garrett in connection with his drug conviction. The looming threat of releasing a monster like Garrett back into the wild prompted action, and Garrett was arrested and tried for the murders. McClure was convicted and sentenced before Garrett, but the trial itself followed the exact same vein. Following McClure's conviction, Garrett was convicted in turn, and they were both sentenced to four consecutive life terms, one for each of their victims. During the trial, Garrett maintained his innocence, but the trial convinced the jury. Garrett had ordered that both Compton and her twins be wiped out because of her spurning him and turning snitch to the cops over the Love Nest incident. Don Sessler's son, Gary, was simply in the wrong place at the wrong time, and presented a complication that the killers needed to silence. The cases against Garrett McClure were composed almost entirely of testimony from prison informants and bikers who came forward to say that the two had been bragging of the killings behind bars. The trial was likely the most notable spectacle to grace the bench of the sleepy Washington County Courthouse located in Hillsborough, a small town near Laurelwood. That spectacle was made ever the worse by the infamy of the crime and the fact that the prosecution relied on a menagerie of malicious bikers to build their case simply added to the insanity. Bikers from the Hells Angels, who were not behind bars, were also a constant presence at the trial. They streamed in in droves to watch the proceedings and ensure that they cleared the Angels' name when it came to the gruesome killing. Even Sonny Barger, who was infamously depicted in the works of Hunter S. Thompson and was a founding member of the Hells Angels, was in attendance. The prosecution agreed with the Angels. According to their case, Garrett was a renegade, acting alone when he ordered the murders, and did not have the backing of the club. The case was followed very closely by the legal community as well. The unique nature of the crime, an outlaw biker hit gone bad that left two little girls dead holding their teddy bears, ensured that. The San Francisco Chronicle quoted Terry Katz, a detective of the Maryland police, as saying, quote, 
The Margot Compton case is internationally famous. If you're involved in outlaw bikers in any way, you know the Margot Compton case because of its magnitude and barbarism. It's probably one of the most brutal crimes anywhere. The defense, too, relied on a stream of criminals, mostly peeled from the California prison system. They backed up Garrett's story that they had not been involved in the killings, despite his proximity to Margot and his ample motive to wish her ill will. Ultimately, the trial became an epic war of words as convict after convict either threw their lot in with the prosecution or stood staunchly in Garrett's defense. Each side called more than 40 witnesses for each of the trials. While the parade of prisoners served their ultimate purpose for the prosecution in securing a guilty verdict for both Garrett and McClure, they also offered a unique glimpse behind the bars of California's massive prison system. Snug in their legally protected bubble on the defense stand, the career criminals called upon for testimony reveal the world inhabited by ruthless men with sleazy names such as Dirty Dick, Booger, Bulldog, Doug the Thug, to name a few. These dirty dicks and boogers, despite no longer having their freedom, controlled life behind bars with iron fists, making life unbearable for any who dared stand in their way. The leadoff hitter for the prosecution and one of the star witnesses was Iron Mike Thompson, a convicted murderer who had been a member of the Aryan Brotherhood while behind bars. He left the Brotherhood behind, and his congenial behavior and scholarly testimony clash with his muscle-bound, tattoo-laden frame. According to Thompson, he was so disgusted by the crime that McClure had executed and Garrett ordered, he was tempted to put out an execution order of his own. The true downfall for Garrett and McClure came due to the fact that they could not keep their mouths shut. There was no material evidence to tie either of them to the case, and despite Garrett's proximity to Compton, it had taken the state two decades to piece together a case against the two. The pair seemed secure in their association with the blacker side of society, sure that even if they bragged about the killings, their fellow inmates would never think to rat them out. However, as Thompson and his fellow inmates detailed during the trial, even the most calloused inmates have no respect for those who kill children, no matter what the motive may be. The fact that innocent children had died as a result of the actions of Garrett and McClure became their downfall. Even among the rogues' gallery behind California prison bars, harming a child was not accepted. Interestingly enough, Garrett and McClure should have been aware of this fact. It is well known in prison that any inmates whose crimes relate to a child are kept separate from the general population. Thompson testified as such, quote, A child molester, child killer, they don't stay on the main line if they stay in the prison. If they're not locked up, they're killed, and that's simply the way it is. In addition to this well-established rule against those who would do harm to innocent children, other details of California prison life emerged. Thompson and his fellow inmates dazzled the jury and a considerable portion of the nation following the trial with tales of the omnipresence of drugs and weapons behind bars, transported into and around the prison inside the body cavities of the inmates. Thompson even detailed the fact that should he want to eliminate one of his fellow inmates for good, he could easily order a hit on their life. Another inmate, Yosef Casal, detailed the disgusting boasts McClure casually threw around relating to his grim crime. He testified that McClure bragged of his expertise in pumping bullets into children's little heads, saying 22 caliber ammunition was more effective because it wouldn't make them blow up. A former Hells Angels president of the Oakland chapter named Sergei Walton, who later joined Federal Witness Protection to turn informant, testified that McClure admitted the killings to him even before he was behind bars in Oakland during one of their arguments over a woman. Both Garrett and McClure relied upon court-appointed attorneys to come to their defense. So extensive was the running list of convicts testifying against their clients that rather than attempt to counteract those claims, the attorneys chose instead to display their scorn for the prosecution's chosen witnesses. They pulled from the dregs of California's prisons to build a defense that was based upon the fact that Thompson and his fellow witnesses who chose to testify for the prosecution were simply convicts lying to the state in hopes to improve their lot in prison, maybe even hack a few years off of some of their sentences or obtain privileges in jail once thought unreachable. The star witness for the defense was convicted murderer Victor Carafa, a well-known prison escape artist flown in from federal prison in Marion, Illinois. Carafa stated that Hell's Angel Jim Jim Brandes bragged of shooting the Comptons years ago while trying to recruit Carafa for an armed car robbery. 
The defense team built on this testimony to present an alternate version of the facts in which Sergei Walton, not Garrett, ordered the hit, which was then carried out by Jim Jim and a buddy. Ultimately, the defense's attempts to undermine the testimony of the witnesses for the prosecution was a failure. They were unable to establish a viable alternative to the twisted tale supported by the convicts who testified for the state. Jim Jim testified during the McClure trial that he knew nothing of the Compton murders. Before he could participate in Garrett's trial, he hung himself in prison. The prosecution dismissed offhand the notion that Walton had anything to do with the murders. Defense lawyer Walker is quoted in explaining that the defense had next to no time to scrape together a counter to the prosecution's 15-year investigation. He stated, quote, I've never had to do so much in so little time. Walker was deeply frustrated after the trials, which cost the state of Oregon around $3 million. Their case was full of holes, but the jury chose to believe the other side. McClure and Garrett chose to face their trials very differently. McClure refused to take the witness stand insisting that he was being sent up the river by the prosecution. Garrett was quite active in his trial, frequently spouting advice at his attorney and shouting hearsay during key points of testimony. Eventually, Garrett did take the stand, and he claimed he had not known Thompson and the other informants during the key times he had been spilling his alleged confessions. Furthermore, Garrett insisted that he did not know McClure until well after the date of the murders. Quote, I had nothing to do with it, period, Garrett proclaimed to the jury. After swift deliberation, both juries returned a verdict of guilty. Both men were handed four consecutive life sentences, one for each life that was claimed during the murder, and finally, after nearly two decades, justice was found for Margot Compton and her two sweet little girls. Graham, their eternal champion, retired from the sheriff's office shortly after the McClure trial, but continued to work with the prosecution until after Garrett's verdict was secured a year later. Music is provided by Hex System. Major sources for this episode include When Jailbirds Sing, an article from the San Francisco Chronicle, and Masters of Menace, an article from the Rolling Stone magazine. For a full list of sources or links to our contributors, please see our show notes. Follow us on Twitter or Instagram at CompulsionCast to stay up to date on our latest episodes and news. See you in two weeks.